This is the nature of things. Laser weapons are often the weapons of choice in sci-fi space wars, but the U.S. Air Force has years of experience with them, too. This is ETSL-1. ETSL stands for Electric Discharge Coaxial Laser. ETSL-1, laser on in five. The Air Force told Congress that it had no intentions of using Starfire for anything related to anti-satellite weapons. However, they are doing a test to make the laser beam very skinny and make it stay very stable as it goes up, and they're going to target that on a satellite. One of the things that I think people need to know is that most technology that's used in space can be used either for weapons purposes or it can be used for totally benign good purposes. Um, small microsatellites that can go around a big satellite and take pictures. Good idea. That same little microsatellite that's going around the big satellite could be sent up to go around another person's satellite and run into it and kill it. Just over 50 years ago, the first satellite was spun into orbit. Space filled us with optimism and awe. But were we, in fact, just staking out a new war zone? We think space is a pristine, majestic, and untouched place. But is it? It now seems that even space is getting cluttered. There are all kinds of satellites and even space junk orbiting the Earth. So how much of it is connected to military ambitions in space? From a city street, the end of the Earth's atmosphere and the beginning of space is a hundred kilometers away. It's called the Kármán line. Space is closer than it seems. If you look at space, lots of times you think about the Hubble telescope or, you know, Mars probes, but most people don't realize that they use space every day. You use them each time you rely on a positioning system for air, for sea, for land traffic control, and even in your own car. There would be no weather forecasting, disaster monitoring, without satellites. Our entire life depends on satellites. They're essential, but we're not conscious of that until we lose it. technology, and 45 nations own their own orbiting satellites. But the United States is the master of space. It dominates as the owner and user of space systems, both civilian and military. Space is the backbone of our national security. There is no substitute, and there is no alternative to military dominance in space. And this conviction should drive our course for the next 50 years. The U.S. Air Force Academy trains the officers who will be the military space elite of tomorrow. Caesar Augustus came to tower 27 years before Christ was born. People in the Roman Empire lived better under Caesar Augustus than they had in any empire on Earth during any previous time. Roads improved, pirates no longer threatened ships on the high seas. Life was so good during this time that the period acquired a name. It was and is still referred to as the Pax Romana, which means the Roman peace. 
Another period of peace has acquired a name. It is called the Pax Americana, or the American Peace. The cadets understand that they have a mission. My name is Cadet First Class Colton Tuttle. I'm a cadet at the Air Force Academy. I graduate in 44 days, and I'm just hoping to do my part to make sure that uh, everyone here can enjoy their freedoms. Americana is a political view which simply says that because America is currently the sole superpower that it has not only the ability but the responsibility into the far future to maintain world peace. Eyes. Right. America now has the chance to establish an American empire, a Pax Americana, that will last for many, many decades. And one of the ways to do this is to establish strong American control of space. China carried out its first anti-satellite weapons test on an old weather satellite about 500 miles up. According to U.S. government officials, after three misses, China succeeded in shooting down one of its own aging weather satellites. The test may be part of China's efforts to establish a military presence in space. Does this mean the spy satellites the United States depends on could be shot down? The American media made a big story out of China's 2007 anti-satellite test. It could cripple us. Is that what they're up to? Was it a sign of a growing rivalry in space weapons? Space has become the backbone of American military power. It may also be its Achilles heel. The United States, and particularly its intelligence services, worry about an attack on the United States that is not nuclear weapons, that is not chemicals, that is not uh, biological, but is technological. A surprise attack in space. This is uh, the ultimate nightmare. By knocking out 50 U.S. military satellites, the uh, Chinese could literally cripple the U.S. military. They could prevent the military from being able to communicate with its forces. They could blind the U.S. intelligence community, which uses electro-optic satellites uh, to determine uh, military force movements around the world. And they could also cripple the guidance systems that are used on precision-guided munitions that are satellite-guided. In many sense, it could be a kind of an electronic Pearl Harbor. Without space, uh, the U.S. would be unable uh, to conduct any type of military operation in an effective way. There's a tremendous premium on the United States being able to prevent other people from attacking our assets in space and to ensure that we can continue to exercise full use of them and, if necessary, also to be able to deny others use of similar assets uh, for their own purposes. The U.S. Air Force will lead the charge. The world has changed. As more and more countries develop a presence in outer space, the possibility of a space battle is no longer science fiction. Our new world requires new solutions. Meet U.S. Air Force Space Command. This elite force is America's eye in the sky, keeping watch over our interests high above the ground. In Colorado Springs, the Aeronautics Laboratory spreads over 5,000 square meters. I'm the permanent professor and head of the Department of Astronautics here at the Air Force Academy. And we've been continually teaching the fundamentals of astronautics to our cadets. And every cadet that has graduated from the Air Force Academy, almost 40,000 now, have taken at least one course in our department. This area right here, what's that called? Bow shock. Bow shock, right. And superimposed on this, of course, we have a HEO. Highly elliptic orbit. In military strategy, it shows that if you want to control the battlefield, you need to be the first in seizing the high ground, the most advanced frontier. Whether it be land, sea, air, and now space, 
the person that controls that has the advantage. So making sure that we can deny our enemies space is a huge advantage. September 6, 1944. Armed with over a ton of high explosive, Germany's first tactical rocket, now called the V-2, the vengeance weapon, is fired at London. Hitler's army was the first to reach the high ground of space with the pioneering V-2 rocket. The V-2 was the first human-engineered object to travel through space, en route to its targets in Europe. Cette fusée a été développée dans le cadre du Troisième Reich. Elle a été utilisée par les armées nazies. Euh, à la fin de la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, c'était les SS qui étaient en charge d'assurer la, le, disons, la réalisation du programme. The chief engineer behind the V2's design and manufacture was a young SS officer, Werner von Braun. This space weapons pioneer had created the very first ballistic missile. That sparked interest across the Atlantic. La V2, c'est vraiment considéré à la fin de la guerre comme quelque chose qu'il fallait absolument prendre aussi bien par les soviétiques que par les occidentaux. Et donc von Braun eh bien, a été récupéré avec une centaine de ses meilleurs ingénieurs dans le cadre d'une opération qui s'appelait Opération Paperclip, c'était le nom de code. Il a été transporté aux États-Unis. Le Pentagon a assigné von Braun et son équipe de scientifiques scientists la task de designer une version improved de the V2. Spearheading the Redstone, the first U.S. ballistic missile, propelled von Braun to the highest sphere of military and scientific influence. Werner von Braun uh, ultimately became associate director of NASA, and his uh, former Nazi scientists functioned as collaborators with the U.S. military in uh, looking towards space as a new arena of war. Gentlemen, will you please take your seat so we can begin today's conference. I take a great deal of pleasure in presenting to you today as our guest speaker, Dr. Werner von Braun. Gentlemen, the conquest of outer space is the greatest technological challenge of the age in which we live. On the right side of this picture, you see a large wheel-shaped space station. This, of course, offers tremendous possibilities to reconnaissance, and both in the civilian sense as in the military sense. These uh, Nazi scientists, these Nazi space scientists that came to this country under Project Paperclip developed uh, schemes to essentially control the Earth from space with space-based weapons. It seems even feasible to use such a platform in space as a base for the bombing of objects on the ground. And it is my opinion that such bombing could be carried out with an unprecedented accuracy from such a station. La plupart des ingénieurs allemands qui ont été ainsi, euh, qui sont partis ainsi aux États-Unis, ont été pendant quelques années considérés avec une certaine suspicion, mais ensuite ils sont devenus euh, citoyens américains et ils ont joué un rôle dans le développement de l'espace aux États-Unis, moins des missiles. Et von Braun, donc, a, plus tard, est devenu le grand responsable de la construction des fusées géantes Saturne. Then, October 4, 1957. Russia shocks the free world. The USSR hurls into orbit the world's first Earth satellite, Sputnik 1. The Soviets are now the unquestionable leaders in the race for space. We've been assigned the mission of launching a scientific Earth satellite. I promised the Secretary of the Army that we would be ready in 90 days or less. Let's go, Werner. Werner von Braun met the U.S. military's 90-day deadline. His modified V-2 launched the first American satellite into orbit. One, by command, 